Well, I'm so excited to have you on the show, Vanessa. This is so fun. It's it's uh, very rare where I get to take a lifestyle investor mastermind member and highlight all the cool things that they are doing in this world. And I probably should do more of it, quite frankly, because our tribe, our community is just so incredible. And there are so many things I want to highlight about people, but your story is just a wonderful story that I think can inspire so many. And so I'm excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. And I second that we have an amazing tribe. So definitely have more of them on the show. So you are a doctor by trade. You are, you know, you're in family medicine. Um, you live out in San Diego and uh, which, by the way, is one of the most beautiful places. It, it's uh, I, I love it when it came down to, you know, it's really funny when we were figuring out where we were going to move, um, you know, at, at a certain period of time, I had, you know, an exit and it was not nothing substantial, but it gave me the freedom to move wherever I wanted to move. And so uh, my wife and I were talking and I said, well, uh, you know, I've got two places on my list. Um, I said, I love Austin and I love San Diego. And my wife said, I've got one place on my list and it's Austin. So Austin won. <laughs> uh, but I used to take an Smart annual move. trip, uh, hanging out with all my friends out there in San Diego. So I love it out there. Um, but, but I want to, I want to talk about your story. Like what made you want to be a doctor? Like how early on did you decide that? Because you, you love it. And at the same time, you have been able to, to take what is normally a very busy schedule that a doctor has and you've been able to invest in and diversify your assets in an incredible way so uh share with us how you got started vanessa yeah sure um so i felt that i wanted to be a doctor when i was in high school and so the reason was it's not very exciting but it was practical because i didn't have an entrepreneurial bone in my body um, nobody in my family was an entrepreneur and nobody really even went to college. So it was kind of out there, but I had a, I had a science teacher say, you would be a very good doctor. Um, and I was also good at, you know, other stuff. And so I was like, well, I could either be a lawyer or a doctor. And I was like, well, I don't really like lawyers. And I don't think I would like that. That sounds boring. So doctor it is, you know, I wanted to help people, but honestly, what what it was for me was the security of knowing that when I got out of college, I would have a job, you know, I would have a title, I would be employable. The idea of going into um, college and paying you know, a bunch of money, which I was paying myself, nobody was, you know, putting me through college. And with like a, with a BA in liberal arts or an economics degree, even, I mean, uh, I just had no idea what that meant. The, the, the possibilities are endless, I'm sure, but it scared the crap out of me. So I was like, I'm definitely going to have a job. And I thought about, well, I could be a nurse or I could be a pharmacist. And, you know, I thought, doctor, that sounds like that's pretty much at the top of the food chain. And so I think I will, I will do that. Um, of course, I didn't know at the time that being a doctor doesn't mean that you're at the top of the food chain. And it doesn't mean that you're on boss because you're even in Canada, where I'm from originally, um, doctors are independent, but their boss is the government. It's like one giant HMO who pays them. And so, and of course now I'm in the States and, um, and I love it here. It's, it's amazing. I came straight out of residency, but um, you know, you learn how you're not really that high on the pecking order. <laughs> well, it's interesting because there's, you know, I talk about this a lot about like the, the reality and the illusion of reality. And uh, you know, I've shared this analogy before where a lot of people want to live in a gated community because it's safe. You know, the gate keeps the bad people out. But the reality is a gate's not going to keep bad people out that want to get in. It's an illusion of safety, but but mentally people feel more safe and therefore it is their reality. And I think the world of being a doctor for most people, it's it's expectations not meeting reality because um, a lot of people think doctors make a tremendous amount of money, but doctors spend a lot of money to get to the point that they can make a lot of money. So then when they're making a lot of money, it's going to debt service. And then there's, you know, in, in many regards, like handcuffs to the hospital or business or government or whoever you work for. So there's, there's often not the autonomy that exists later on when maybe a doctor would start their own practice. 
which is also a big risk because a lot of doctors didn't learn how to run a business. And oh, so a lot of them failed absolutely. because of that. Yeah, we had, um, I remember distinctly in my last week of residency, we had like a half day on how to start your own practice. And like literally in Canada, that's what everybody does. They go out and they hang up a shingle. And because you've already, you don't have to worry about insurance contracts and payers and blah, blah, blah. There's only one, right? And so you literally go out and you start your own practice. And I mean, that is just terrifying that they're sending all these doctors out there brand new to start their own enterprise. So, yeah. A lot of people go to college for a specialized degree to start a business. A lot of people will be an understudy. Um, but with doctors, you spent all your years of college, you've got your, you know, additional years, your residency, and this is focused on your craft. This is focused on being a great doctor. And then, oh, let me give you one week on how to run your own business. And that's just not sufficient. So it, it's interesting to see. I mean, it's pretty obvious to see why a lot of doctors don't go out on their own. But I think the doctors that really kind of get ahead of the game in a financial regard do so by going on their own and figuring it out. And there's like, you know, I mean, obviously there are a lot of doctors that can make great money and after debt service is paid, or maybe if they didn't have debt service, it's a different scenario, but I've got a lot of friends that started their own practice. The doctors that have just, you know, in, in many different uh, industries, whether it be dental, whether it be optometry, whether it be, you know, um, family practice. And um, it's amazing what can happen as these entrepreneurial skills are honed and learning how to scale a business and open up multiple locations. It's really cool. So I'm curious your thoughts around that and what you've seen in your community and with your friends. Right. I mean, I'm, what I've, when I started, which was 19 years ago, I moved down from my uh, residency in Canada down here to San Diego, and I've been at the same job ever since. So, you know, I've been here for 19 years and worked my way up so that now I'm the medical director of the group. And we have 12 locations and 80 plus providers, you know, so it's grown a lot from when I first started, it was only like two locations. And so I've seen the evolution of medicine during that time as well. Back then I was joining a small group and I was a W2, but we became shareholders and we still are physician owned. So we are running our own business. It's just, it's a little different, you know, because you've got the corporate structure of a CEO and a CFO and all that, that take care of things versus like a, what we call onesies and twosies, which are like the solo doctor or the one that has a partner. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't have had the skills to do that at the beginning. And I might've messed it up and I might've caused myself a lot more harm than good because we do come out with a lot of debt and the docs now coming out, especially those in primary care, they do want the security of a W2 job with time off and which is kind of a whole nother issue. But um, you know, they want to have all of the 401k benefits and everything all baked in. And, and that's just the way it is now for most primary care, especially in California, where we do need to have insurance contracts, because if you have your own business and you're taking insurance, you're not going to do that by yourself. Those docs who are out there by themselves doing it, um, they probably don't take a lot of insurance and, you know, people are paying cash or they're using their PPOs, but it's a different world here in California. So I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that they took me on from Canada, you know, getting a a visa and all that was not easy. It's not easy to come down. Super grateful. The first six months I was here, I was just starstruck. Look at all the palm trees. This is amazing. You know, the weather is so great. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm super happy with the move that I made. But I realized after, a, I think it was about after 10 years of practice, that there had to be a little bit more because I was working super hard. We used to do everything, go to hospital, do admissions, um, rounding, skilled nursing, urgent care. You know, so we were working our butts off, making pretty good money, but I was really intent on not working until I was 65. You know, the older generation of doctors, they stop working when they can't <laughs> work anymore, you know, and that's not how I wanted to be. I wanted to have quality of life, start a family. And I, you know, even though I was being super frugal and saving a lot of my money, like half, half I, I was diligent for about five years, saving and investing, of course, in the stock market, you know, and plotted out my income over five years and my net worth. And it was a straight line. And I was like, 
okay, this is not going to work for me. You know, I am not going to get to where I need to get to without some kind of exponential growth and the compounding. I'm like, where's the compounding? The compounding doesn't happen in five years. I figured that out later. It takes decades for compounding. And when you're a doc, you get started so late that you don't, you don't get that head start, you know? And so I, I figured I had to start looking elsewhere for investing. And that's what kind of got me into learning that I, I knew that real estate was the way to do it. And so that's what I focused on. Vanessa, you, you made a comment that is so powerful and it's just so important that people hear this because you recognize even as a high income earner, even moving up the corporate ladder to where you are, to a director of a hospital, of a medical practice, um, that and, and even saving half of the money that you make, I mean, this is incredible that you're still not going to get to where you want to be. And I think most people don't even have the luxury of, you know, those opportunities that you're talking about. And so, you know, to, to figure out what's next and to say, hey, I need to start investing in other things and real estate and myself and my own education outside of the medical field. I think that's incredible. Uh, and I wish more people did it. I hope that this podcast episode can inspire more people to do it because I know a lot of doctors and um, a lot of them, especially the ones that live in expensive cities, they're just making ends meet. It's, it's not mm -hmm. like what many people think. And, you know, conversely, I've got a, a friend here in town in Austin that is, um, I got to be careful not to say too much, but is selling uh, all of his practices for um, just under nine figures for barely under nine figures. And um, what an incredible opportunity, but I know so many more that are not even really getting ahead, right? Mm -hmm. it, it may seem on paper, like they're making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love what you've done. So walk us through, like, how did you get started? Like, this had to be a little scary. You're a doctor, you, you know, you're figuring out how to you know, carve out time to do something different, but you don't have the expertise yet. You invest in your first real estate deal, I think back in uh, 2008. Walk us through that. Right. Well, the first deal that I did in 2008 was uh, was just a real a realtor friend of mine said, you know what, um, this area is going to really do great after this, you know, this downturn. And this was at the beginning of the downturn. And I had some extra money and you know, like 40 grand was a lot to me. And so I made a down payment on this home, which was a short sale in Riverside County, just North of San Diego. And I bought so early that it kept going down. And so I freaked out a little bit like, oh, maybe his advice wasn't so good. So instead of doing what I should have been doing, which was buying more of these houses in that area, I, I just kind of sat it and forget it. I had good tenants and I just kind of was like, okay, well, I did it. You know, that's fine. We'll just sit there and watch it. Um, of course, that home that I bought for, I think, 225 is worth 600 now. So, you know, it would have been great to get 10 or 20 of those. I'd be set right now. But I basically went on with my life. I, I got married. I had a child. I was just focused on other things, right? And that was when I kind of woke up after saving really hard for five years. And I realized, you know, I, it actually all came to a head when I was in Minnesota, riding my bike around a lake with my family for vacation. And it was so like peaceful and you could just hear the gravel on the bike wheels and the kids were kind of laughing. And, um, and I was like really calm inside. And I was like, Oh, what is that feeling? And I was like, that's called contentment. And I realized that that was a feeling I did not have enough of. We work so hard. And as doctors, we're trading our time for money. We don't get paid when we're not there, you know? And so there's this disincentive to take time off and do things that we enjoy. And so I became passionate about, I need to get that feeling. And being the practical liberal person that I am, I thought, well, I need to buy a house by a lake. So I'm going to look at Lake Tahoe and, you know, that didn't work out. And so I, but it got me on the path. And so I just started like devouring books on real estate, you know, bigger pockets and listening to podcasts. And I picked up Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I had read when I was younger and just was kind of like fired up about it. My husband thought I was kind of crazy, figured this one would, this, you know, would pass my, you know, interest because that happens, you know, regularly. Sometimes it's, 
weird things like fermenting vegetables and you know but this time it was real estate and it stuck so you know that was like five years ago and once i got the taste for investing in real estate which i realized i couldn't do actively in san diego anymore because I thought I would repeat what I did in 08. And of course it was much too late by then and kept looking and looking. And I'm like, I've got to find a way to invest in real estate that I can do. Now being an active real estate investor, like, you know, buying homes and flipping them, obviously I don't have time for that. And this isn't the market. Um, I didn't want to buy a single family home in Memphis that I don't even know anything about and get fleeced by some property management company. That didn't feel good either. So I started looking at multifamily and syndications. And once I found out what the returns were, first of all, and how profitable it could be in a completely passive role, I was totally hooked. And so that segued into me wanting to get more involved, learning more, joining a coaching program, learning how to be a syndicator, basically, because I always like to learn about what I'm doing. I love it. So I want to dive into that. But before we do, um, you, you made a comment here that I think is really important. You bought a single family home. And even though it went down in value, th this is why I love cash flowing assets. Even though it went down in value, you didn't have to sell it because it cash flowed. So you could weather the storm of the highs and the lows. You could weather that downturn and not be forced to sell it. And so one of the things that I, I really talk about is getting, um, you know, getting your passive income to equal or exceed your, you know, income to survive and eventually your lifestyle income. And so that's a great story, a great way to say, hey, let me buy this home because it cash flows. I can, I can wait and hold it. I, this could be a long-term play. It could be a short-term play. It can be whatever I want. I have flexibility because my renter is covering the cost of the mortgage payment. So nice job. Totally brilliant. Um, let's talk about syndications because you've done like 32 or 33 syndications, I believe. And I'd love to hear all the different paths that you've taken. And, and just so everyone knows, can you elaborate on what a syndication is? Yeah, absolutely. A syndication is usually, to keep it simple, purchasing a large asset and bringing in limited partners or investors to help with the um, the equity portion of the investment. So you get debt service on it, like a mortgage, and then the rest is provided by the limited partners. And then the um, the operators, the general partners who, you know, sign a loan, run the business, take care of the day-to-day -day type of stuff, um, they provide returns to those investors. And those investors, once they write their check, is completely passive, which is the beauty of it. And, you know, getting a preferred return, which is your cash flow, which is awesome. And then some equity on the back end when they sell or refinance. So, you know, syndications can be anything though. They, they're not just real estate. You can syndicate startups, IPOs, Broadway plays, you know, anything can be syndicated. That's awesome. So the, the beauty here is for anyone that feels like you don't have time, like I'm already so busy in my job, there's no way I have the time to invest. And for some people, they fall into that trap. For most people, they fall in the trap of either A, um, not investing and consuming everything that they make, B, investing everything they make back into their business, or C, taking the, the path of least resistance and investing everything else into the stock market, into 401ks, into qualified plans. And so there are different ways, in my opinion, better ways, at least ways to diversify. So not all of your assets are in your business and in um, your you know qualified plans and in the stock market. And I think if you look at the wealthiest people in the world and you analyze, and I've spent a lot of time researching the wealthiest people, like what does their portfolio look like? And, and of the people that are like literally the, the wealthiest in the world, 50% or more of their portfolio is in real estate and private equity. And so if you think about that, the majority of their net worth is not in the stock market. The majority is in private enterprises, private business, private real estate. And um, you're saying, hey, I was able to invest in these syndications as a busy doctor with a, a vibrant practice when I'm moving up the corporate ladder at the same time, adding more responsibilities because it doesn't cost time when you find the right operators. Is that right? Absolutely. 
So interesting. So what are some of the syndications that you've done? So I started out in multifamily because I was part of a, a team. You know, I was, my mentor was basically uh, being the, helping us, you know, get large multifamily. And so we worked with a, a, a large operator in Texas. And so the deals were really beautiful. And of course, I, my, one of my taglines for my business is I'm investing alongside my, you know, investors. So my goal isn't to become a, a syndicator. My goal is to become financially free. And I want that cash flow. I want to be able to exit medicine if I want to. Not that I necessarily want to, but I might want to scale back. So, you know, these are amazing deals. So I started out with a lot of multifamily. And then since I have branched out into um, some mobile home parks, which I know you love, and also uh, self-storage is really a good place to be, especially if you can find the right operator. Um, you know, all the they're all getting saturated now. You know, the tailwind from 2012 and on might be slowing down a bit. There's a lot more people out there that want to be syndicators and are hunting for deals, but there's always a way, especially if you are very particular about who you work with, of just having a couple of good, different, distinct niches. And then of course, land entitlement is my most recent um, foray. And I just love land entitlement because it really, it, it's helping because there's a four million home shortage in the U.S. right now. And there's a variety of reasons why that is, um, not the least of which is that the home builders got burned in 2008, big time during the downturn. They had purchased a whole bunch of raw land and it was sitting on their books, literally worthless. And so they decided going forward, we're not going to do that again. We are going to buy land, preferably when it's all set, meaning entitled, paper lots, shovel ready, you know, land banking, whatever you want to call it. So they want to buy, they'll pay a premium for land when it's all ready to go because it reduces their risk significantly and allows them to buy land, get it, you know, built and sold within a year, um, you know, supply chain issues, excluding that. But so, you know, that's a great way to help basically profit from the major demand right now. I mean, if you're in the business of buying single family homes as your business, you're kind of in trouble right now because it's hard to find anything that cash flows. Um, I am doing a few Airbnbs here and there. That's about the only way I can find anything that will cash flow is, you know, if you can bump up the rents significantly. And those poor people, the millennials are now the biggest demographic for the next three years and they wanna buy homes. You know, they're done with the apartments. They want to buy a home. They want to start a family and they're getting shut out. So, you know, if you can partner with an operator that is doing the land entitlement, building homes that are affordable in the 300 to 325K range, the brand new, and these repeat things that, you know, young people can afford, regular people can afford this and we're desperately in need of it. So that is why I'm really kind of passionate about that right now. Oh, it sounds just incredible. Just for clarity's sake, I think it's important to kind of dissect and break down what land entitlement is, because I feel like that can be an intimidating word, but basically you're taking raw land and you're getting it ready uh, to be able to have a development built on it, whether it's multifamily or you know whatever it ends up being. But can you break down the specifics of what entitlement is, land entitlement, land banking? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really boring. Um, it's not sexy and it's not a DIY kind of a project. You don't go to a weekend seminar and then come out and be able to entitle land. So I always said I wasn't going to invest in land because the only thing I knew about was buying raw land and selling raw land. And that's a high frequency business and that's not passive. So that wasn't for me because you have to do a lot of volume and you take a small amount off each sale. So the land entitlement, um, I gave a talk on it recently, and I mean, I felt bad for the listeners because it was really so boring, but I wanted to show them the detail that goes into the process. So um, the folks that are doing this, they have to go to the city. You're dealing with permits, zoning, soil testing. There's a big environmental survey that's done where they literally have to go over the entire land, look for anything that might be off. Like, is there anything on the land? Is there like a is there like something with liquid in it? What is that liquid? You know, what's underneath the land? Is there big rocks that are going to prevent them from putting in the pipes that they need to put in? You know, so it's basically a very, very detailed survey of the land. Also requires dealing with the city and the county. Um, you might even have to do one of those, you know, things where you ask for community input and, you know, go to events like that. So you're dealing with the government, the county, the engineers, 
And it's a process that you know usually takes about nine to 18 months to kind of go from start to finish. And it's very important to have a strong contract so that when you're doing your due diligence, you're not buying land yet. You don't buy it until you are like 99% sure that this is going to be a saleable piece of land. That's great. And and so I'm assuming that you have to do a phase one as you're mm -hmm. doing your entitlements. And mm -hmm. for everyone that is not in real estate, that's never had to do one of these, I do these on, on any of the properties that I buy. And you're basically making sure that there was never a gas station, never a laundromat, never a place that would have contaminants yep. that uh, would get into the soil that could then be problematic for anyone who lived on it. And uh, and so it, it's not that expensive, but when there is a fail on the phase one to remediate that, it's an incredible cost to go through. It, sometimes it's virtually impossible to overturn, but you know, kind of rule of thumb as I've learned it for me, at least is the moment it's a, it's a no, I just walk. I don't even try to, uh, get a phase two and, and anything like that. I don't want to resolve it. It's too expensive. Too much can go wrong. And sometimes you can figure all this out. If you, you know, go through the city records, you can figure out what has been on the land. You know, has it been raw land, uh, from, you know, the time of records until now? Well, you probably don't have an issue then, but if there's ever been something else on it, then it's really important that you do that. So, uh, very interesting. Now let's talk about the returns here because, uh, and so with land entitlement, so before you were talking raw land, flipping raw land, small margins, you need a large volume of transactions to really make a good return with land entitlement. It's different. And you've got a, a timeline with which you've got it under, you know, due diligence. You're only going to buy it. If you know that there's a buyer lined up, um, you're going to lock it in at one rate, you're going to sell it at another rate. And it's a short period of time really between uh, when you buy it and when you sell it. So I'd love to hear some of the specifics there. Yeah. I mean, you're forcing appreciation in like the fastest way possible, really. I mean, apart from building, because then you're making it worth even more, but basically um, you're taking, you're taking the raw land and getting it ready. And during that process, the land acquisition managers are these specialists called LAMs and they, they know what they're doing. They used to work for the, the national home builders, but now they're, you know, working for private companies because the home builders either aren't doing it or when they do do it, it's so cumbersome and full of red tape that they just can't grab that piece of land, you know? So, so they take the, the land and, um, you know, they put it through the whole process and basically double, usually a good rule of thumb is approximately double the value of the land in nine to 18 months. Um, they, like I said, they have a, a, a land assignment contract, but they don't complete the close until they're sure. Another option is sometimes a simultaneous close where they have an LOI, which they frequently get ahead of time, almost always. And um, they sometimes can actually do a close where they purchase and sell it in the same day, which takes less capital, which is great. That's incredible. I've had some friends that have done that. So first of all, I've got a bunch of friends that have done uh, very well in land entitlements. And I've got other friends that have definitely done the uh, transaction, you know, day of where you basically close on both. You close on the buy side and the sell side uh, and you make that margin. And again, less out of pocket, less hold time. It's just a brilliant way uh, to do it when you can line that up. Now, you had a deal that was really fantastic. Uh, and I'd love to get some of the specifics because you had a, a killer return on a, a short time frame. Yeah, yeah. We um, purchased a 500 plat land in near south of Charlotte. And that was in December of last year. The purchase of the land was 6.5 million. Mm -hmm. And, you know, due diligence costs, et cetera, was about 1 million. And so we raised money for that. It was just a one-off you know, land entitlement, not a big fund, just this one piece of property. And when we were bringing in investors, we had an LOI from Madame Homes, one of the big national home builders for 14 million. Now the land costs 6.5, they're offering 14 million. And they are basically telling this operator, we want that land, please get it ready for us and then we'll buy it from you. So the operator um, decided not to actually sign the LOI. And so they pushed it out. They pushed it out, they pushed it out. The land is ready to close this week and the sale price with Madame, the final sale price is 16.75 million. So, I mean, 
I'm not that great at math, but that's a pretty darn good return, you know. Nope, and yeah. and the next day after they finalized that, um, Dr. Horton came in and said, "We'll pay you 17.5 million for that piece of land." So there's a lot of money to be made if you are efficient and and good at this. And it's not like you can just walk in the front door of Dr. Horton and be like, "I'd like to." I'd like to entitle some land for you. <laughs> you you <laughs> kind of have to, you have to know the market, you have to know the people and, and kind of have a back way in. So how long of a time frame was it on that deal from the time you signed to the time that you're closing? So we're going to close this week. So it'll be not 11 months, basically. But I should say that we paid our investors 18% annually, but we paid them out in, um, in August. So, you know, it was an annualized return of 18% that they received. So that was kind of nice. That's awesome. So they're already out of the deal. Very cool. Um, that, that is so fun. Now, you have a book that you wrote that I think is just super clever, has a great title, The Busy Professional's Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing. And what I love about it is you have walked the talk. So you have been the busy professional. You have invested in all these different things, you know, 33, 32, 30 some odd syndications. Um, you've got deeded property that you own. You've, you've done all kinds of things, different asset classes. Um, what made you want to write this book? And, um, and do you feel that this book is all that someone needs to be able to do the things that you've done? Yeah, great question. I mean, I wrote the book because, um, well, I joined a mastermind with some folks that you might know, uh, Hal, Hal Elrod, and it seemed like everybody was writing a book. And I thought that was like, no way, I can't possibly fit that into my schedule. But they were so inspiring. And I was like, okay. So um, I did my mind map and I got it all out there. But the reason I wanted to write it was because I you know, had started my business where I'm bringing in investors to deals and realized that so many people don't know about this. You know, it's still, even though once you're in it, you can't unlearn it and you think everybody knows, there's still so many people that don't know. And I felt like this would be a good way to get the message out of ways to invest that, you know, isn't buying a house, isn't flipping a house, isn't being a landlord, you know, isn't dealing with tenants, toilets, and termites, you know, it's, it's, totally passive. And so I was so passionate about it. I wanted to share that with people. And it also gives them a really good foundation for what is a syndication? What are the FAQs? What are all these terms in the PPM? What is a PPM? How much money am I going to make? And then I did this cool thing where I wanted to know, okay, if I invest a hundred grand per year and reinvest all the dividends, how much am I going to have in passive income? And I created a spreadsheet, um, in Excel because I couldn't find a calculator anywhere. And so this roadmap, I call it roadmap to success, you know, it basically shows after about eight years, you have $108,000 in passive income per year. And, you know, to me, that was phenomenal. But that's just the beginning. Once you spread it out to like 10, 11, 12, 13 years, I mean, it's like in the millions. It's like, okay, this can't be right. Double check my math. No, it's right. So it's pretty, it's pretty phenomenal. And I wanted to share that with people and also help um, people get a good idea of things before they come to me because, you know, the reason they say to write a book is, you know, it's, it's like um, the phone conversations that you're having over and over and over again, put it in a book, people can read it and then they can come talk to you and then they're more educated. Mm, I love it. That is so awesome. Congratulations uh, on taking something that you have had a lot of success with that can help liberate other people and give them time freedom, you know, a lot of people, they think they want financial freedom, but the reason they want financial freedom is for time freedom. Mm -hmm. So I just think that, that is incredible. And, you know, what a blessing you've been to our mastermind as well. Um, I, I just feel so um, privileged to have so many smart doctors like you that have broken the, the chains of, of the norm of just being a doctor and have gotten out of their comfort zones and have done so many other things. And I know you're part of Go Abundance Women, an incredible group of, of entrepreneurs. In fact, a, a bunch of women from your group are part of our mastermind, which is so cool. Um, and it's, it's just neat to see all these different professionals um, kind of walking arm in arm, looking to make a difference in their life and helping support other people uh, to bring them alongside so they can do the same thing. And it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you have a job, it doesn't matter if you run your own business, but you have this opportunity 
if you just move towards it and spend time with people that are doing it. So mm -hmm. uh, I want to just, you know, recognize you and give you major props here, Vanessa. I think it's so cool what you have done. Um, and, and I want to thank you for the time that you've spent on the show today. Where can our audience find out more about you? So um, I have my website, which is vmdinvesting.com. And also my email, you can come, contact me directly at Vanessa, V-A-N-E-S-S-A -S -S at vmdinvesting.com. Those are the easiest ways. Love it. Well, thank you for sharing today. And what a great segue. What a great episode to kind of wrap up as I love doing, which is what are you going to do today to take one step towards financial freedom, towards a life by design, not a life by default? And what a powerful message today is because it lines up exactly that way with something to the T that someone else can do where it doesn't take time. You could be a busy professional, but you can invest in syndications. You can invest in deals with uh, experienced operators. So again, I leave you with this. What's the one step you can take towards financial freedom today? Thanks. And we'll catch you next week.